also um, my teachers when I was at Delhi University and my colleagues and newly found friends. So this 20 minutes I want to talk to you about psychology in Sri Lanka. Now, this is not a tourist board presentation to get more tourists to Sri Lanka, but just want to tell you what Sri Lanka is for those of you who haven't been there. So Sri Lanka is most known for its beaches. Many people come there to relax at the beaches. But now more, more commonly, we also have um, wildlife associated with the beaches. So we have a lot of people coming for whale watching and dolphin watching in certain parts of the year. But Sri Lanka is very diverse, a lot of biodiversity. As an offshoot remark, we have the highest number of reptiles in the world, most of them vicious and venomous. So this is uh, uh, the internal part of our country, which is um, quite a lot of paddy cultivations and a lot of greenery. This is a village, man going to his village through the paddy cultivations. The central part of Sri Lanka is um, tea plantations. So the white specks there are tea pluckers. So it's a very, it's a very beautiful country. Uh, I was in Kathmandu in November for an international meeting and um, they wanted to know where the second meeting would be held and unanimously everybody wanted to have it in Sri Lanka because it's a very beautiful place. However, um, Sri Lanka is not without its mental health issues which are significant despite it being a very beautiful uh, place in the world. But before I talk about the uh, mental health issues in current day Sri Lanka, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what our mental health services were until about 50 years ago. So Sri Lankans are mainly Buddhist, um, and we, we received Buddhism by Emperor Ashoka about 20 centuries ago. This is a, active, a picture of an active Buddhist temple where pilgrims have offered lotuses that day in the morning. So why I want to talk to you a little bit about Buddhism is that we know as psychologists that mindful-based interventions are the third wave of cognitive therapies. It's very well established now in the psychology literature and its roots are 25 centuries ago uh, by the, of the teachings of Gautama the Buddha. Now, in Sri Lanka, a study that we did about 10 years ago on disabled army soldiers, we had an ethnic conflict for 30 years, where the armed forces was able to eradicate the terrorism that we had for 30 years in our country. We went into the armed forces to see the mental health of our armed personnel. And we found that most of them hadn't received formal mental health interventions. However, when we did a survey on their mental health, we found out that uh, diagnosable mental illnesses, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, was not as prominent as what we would have expected. Then we looked at the, some of the social cultural practices that these people may be undergoing. We did a survey. And we found out that those armed personnel who had a very strong belief in rebirth and karma. Now we, as uh, most of us here would be understanding about rebirth and karma because that's a, that's a belief that is also part of Hinduism where we believe on many lives and that the quality of a particular life is based on actions referred to as karma done in previous births. So we found out that armed personnel who believed that their amputation or the fact that they were blind or they were um, the paraplegic, whatever was the reason was because of past karma done in past births, they were able to accept their disability far better with lesser mental health consequences. We also found through this research that armed personnel who got involved in pujas or offerings or chantings of a Buddhist nature, their mental health was significantly better than those who did not. So why I'm presenting to you this little study is to show that over the centuries, though we did not have established mental health services in our country for our people, most of them frequented the monasteries, the Buddhist monasteries, and the Buddhist teachings and the Buddhist practices 
seem to have helped them to stabilize their minds to a certain extent. Now, coming to the current day's uh, mental health needs of our country, this is the current status, um, Sri Lanka had an ethnic conflict, uh, or shall we say a civil conflict, for 30 years. It ended in 2009, fully eradicated by the government forces. Um, so 30 years of a civil internal conflict is a significant issue. I remember uh, when we used to go to work from home, we were not sure whether we'll come back home because bombs were going off in a very random way in many parts of our country, not only in the area where the conflict was happening. So, so several of my friends were blinded or wounded or they never came back home after work. So we were always under a little bit of a pressure. Other than that, Sri Lanka has had several natural disasters. Um, when I was looking through the list of the most the country's the most natural disorder, so, um, disasters, Sri Lanka comes as number four, proportionate to our population. But 10 years ago, it was number 96, way down in the lift. So because of certain wrong practices in relation to the climate and rapid development without thinking of the impact on environment, we have actually really destroyed our ecosystem. So because of that, in 2004, we had the Asian tsunami, and landslides and floods are quite significant in many parts of our country. So that has its own mental health consequences because of displacement, etc. Coming to diagnosable mental illnesses, one study shows that 2.1% of the population at any given time would have major depression, 0.9 with anxiety disorders, and we have the highest number of bars and illicit taverns per person in the world. So the use of alcohol and related substances is the highest in Sri Lanka, despite it having this so-called Buddhist culture, which um, uh, does not accept the use of intoxicants. Sri Lanka also has had the highest suicide rate in the world until recently. It's still in the top 10. So we have a lot of tops but on the other side of the coin. So the mental health picture is not that great. Now that we were looking at mostly the diagnosable mental illnesses, but if you look at mental well-being, um, if you look at mental well-being, um, just read in the Gallup World Poll on happiness, which um, is indicated by things like the income, the health system, the social support system, individuals trust they have in their community and between people and the freedom of speech as indicators of happiness amongst 156 countries Sri Lanka is 116 just for your information from my colleagues from South Asia I also looked at what Nepal is it's 101 Bangladesh is 115 and India is 133 so we are very very low down on the scale of happiness so this means that uh, great improvements in mental health needs to be done. So what have we done? So let's look at a little bit about the education of psychology. I'm not talking about any other mental health profession, psychology per se. We have 15 state universities. Until very recently, only the state provided tertiary education in the country. There's still a lot of animosity towards private education. People don't um, trust private institutes, unlike in other parts of Asia. Only four of these state universities offer undergraduate degrees in psychology, which is very few. And unfortunately, graduating from an undergraduate level likes to refer to themselves as psychologists and provide services, though their degree is purely theoretical. So having only a theoretical undergraduate degree when people set up practices referring to them such as psychologists has created a huge problem in our country where people who are not qualified are actually offering services. There are lots of diplomas and postgraduate diplomas in psychology for those who have done or not done undergraduate psychology and they too go on to offer services such as counseling but again they don't have the proper depth of knowledge which creates its own set of problems. P 
PhDs in psychology are quite common now. So individuals who want to do a pure research degree or going into academics can do a pure research degree in psychology in most of the state universities. However, postgraduate applied psychology degree, there's only one for the entire country and that too was only established 10 years ago in clinical psychology. So let me just talk to you a little bit about this particular course because that's all what we have. Uh, we have termed it a MPhil in clinical psychology as opposed to a DCLIN because we didn't have the resources to offer a DCLIN, a doctorate in clinical psychology. We refer to it as an MPhil, uh, like a bridge between a master's and a PhD. It was um, started in 2008 at the University of Colombo in collaboration with University of London and University of East London. So we had our Sri Lankan colleagues who had migrated to the UK many, many years ago. And together with their expertise, we established this course, which we are quite proud of actually. It's a two year full time course where the students have three placements totaling to 21 hours two compulsory adult placements and one child placement. Uh, the student has to meet a clinical supervisor for one to one and a half hours individually every week. The only problem with this model is that we don't have clinical psychologists in our state hospitals. So these students actually are under the administrative supervision of psychiatrists. So they don't really see how a clinical psychologist works totally. They see the medical model, but they come out of this medical mo model to meet with their clinical psychologist supervisor outside of the hospital setting. So the students become a bit confused as to how we work and how their psychiatric colleagues work in a medical model. So most of our teaching expertise is from Sri Lanka, but we have a quite a good uh, resource pool coming from the UK and the USA. Friends and colleagues who live there, who come on holiday, come and teach in our course. So the, children, the students have an exposure to what's happening out there. So through these 10 years, we have actually managed to have 35 new clinical psychologists for our country, which is a big achievement for us. Now, the practice of clinical psychology is a very complicated matter in Sri Lanka. I'm talking about clinical psychology because that's the most established subspeciality in our country. We have 21.4 million people with huge mental health needs, and we have 45 clinical psychologists. So 21.4 million people, 45 clinical psychologists, and about 60 psychiatrists. So it's a huge dearth of people. We only have three clinical psychologists in the state sector, in the state hospitals. So 21.4 million people, three clinical psychologists, and state hospitals are where the people who are not well-to-do come. Though Sri Lanka is a middle-income country now, most people can't afford private practices. So we have huge numbers of people who have mental health needs who only have three clinical psychologists in the state hospitals throughout the country. And these three people are not health ministry employees. They're academics. So I'm one of the three. So we have these huge numbers of people coming to our clinics, which we can't handle. The, um, all other clinical psychologists are working in the private sector or in international non-governmental organizations or local non-governmental organizations. Now, you might wonder why is the country not recruiting clinical psychologists to state hospitals when we have such mental health issues? We have a lot of problems in trying asking the government to recruit clinical psychologists into state hospitals. The biggest problem is that clinical psychologists in our country would like to be recruited into the government sector and to be acknowledged as independent professionals, not under a psychiatrist. But our government health ministry, along with the consultant psychiatrists, do not want that system. So they would like us to be under the complete clinical supervision of psychiatrists, which we do not agree to. In fact, when I, I, was, uh, I was cleaning up my shelves the other day at home and I found a letter I had written in 2002 to the Ministry of Health asking them to recruit clinical psychologists back then in, as, in, as an independent professional. And now it's 2018 and the situation has not changed. So therefore, 
Um, what the Ministry of Health is saying is that, sure, we will recruit you into the state sector. However, you have to be under the clinical supervision of a psychiatrist. And even if a patient comes for marital therapy, they have to go through a psychiatrist's assessment, diagnosis, and if a psychiatrist is not there, even a medical officer. And then only we will give you a patient to see. Because they feel that clinical psychologists are not competent in diagnosis and formulation. Even after that, say a clinical psychologist in Sri Lanka agrees to this setup, even when they're doing psychotherapy or even psychometric assessments, it has to be supervised by a psychiatrist. So it's a very, very restricted, extremely old-fashioned traditional system they're proposing. For example, this is one of my colleagues, a psychiatrist, who wrote in the Sri Lanka Journal of Psychiatry their views very beautifully written. It says, he says, there is also the tendency for such non-biological therapies to be handed over to non-medical therapists, such as psychologists, occupational therapists, and social workers, whilst recognize the contribution of these professionals. How many? Responsible professional members of a multidisciplinary team, giving them complete responsibility for such therapy is likely to be detrimental. So they actually go on to publish the fact that psychologists should not do even psychotherapy, which is our purview, without a psychiatrist supervision. I think I have only one minute, so I'm going to really quickly go through. So the impact of this issue is that many clinical psychologists who have trained abroad never come back to the country, and those who train in Sri Lanka are eager to go out and never come back. And in relation to the other professions, we only have three organization psychologists, three counseling psychologists, two social psychologists, no forensic psychologists. So it's a very, 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 very tight pack system because of all the issues our country is facing in recruiting and giving opportunities to psychologists. So I'm going to really stop my presentation now because I'm eating into other people. Thank you very much for listening to my very sad story.